we have the completeness axiom for the reals expressed in terms of monotone sequences. And here we've got the analogous property for L1, the monotone convergence theorem. Well, there's a more geometrically appealing way of expressing the completeness axiom for the real numbers in terms of a distance. Now, what I want to do in this program is to generalize the idea of distance to functions in L1 and with it other geometrical ideas such as size and angle. And you'll see that all this geometrical apparatus has tremendous applications to, for example, the theory of Fourier series. Well, first of all, how can I express the completeness axiom for the reals in terms of the distances between points in R? Well, it's very easy. The way to do it is by means of a Cauchy sequence. Now, you remember the definition of a Cauchy sequence. If I've given a, a sequence of real numbers, then for any epsilon greater than naught, I can find a large n such that the distance between subsequent terms of the sequence gets closer and closer together. Well, you probably imagine that such a sequence is bound to have a real number limit. And of course, you're right. Well, this is called the metric completeness axiom for the reals, and it tells us that every Cauchy sequence, and we've abbreviated a Cauchy sequence like this, does in fact have a real number limit. Well, the conclusion is exactly the same as we had with our old completeness axiom, but now we're not restricted to monotone sequences. But the two axioms are logically equivalent, and we've shown that in the correspondence text. But now, if we use a slightly different notation, we can put it in a form that we can generalize. You can see that my Cauchy sequence is expressed in terms of a distance, and also that the result, the limit result, is also expressed in terms of a distance. So all I need in order to ask the question about metric completeness is a space with a metric, a distance defined on it. And such a space is called a metric space. In a metric space, the metric D assigns a real number to each pair of points in M and satisfies four properties. Well, what about L1? Can I make L1 into a metric space? And then can I ask the question, does every Cauchy sequence in L1 have a limit in L1? Well, I can make it into a metric space, and I'll do so in a minute. But first of all, let's get clear the difference between this property and the monotone property. First of all, I'm not restricting myself to monotone sequences. And secondly, here, I'm not talking about pointwise convergence. You see, in pointwise convergence, we don't have a single number which represents the distance between two functions. With pointwise convergence, we consider the distance at each point x between the value of fn and the value of f at x for almost all x. That is, we consider a whole collection of distances, one distance for each point x, except possibly on a null set. What we need for metric completeness is the concept of a single number as the distance between two functions. This is not difficult to define. We merely take the area between the two functions as the distance between them. That is, we integrate the modulus of their difference. And it turns out that this is a well-defined metric. So we can define a metric on L1, and we can ask the question, is L1 metrically complete? Does every Cauchy sequence have a limit in L1? And the answer is yes, it is metric complete. And funnily enough, this is a consequence of the monotone convergence property, as we show in the correspondence text. Well, we've shown that L1 is metrically complete, but this is with respect to another sort of convergence, which we call strong convergence. Now, I said it's a different sort of convergence, but is it really? 
After all, you might think that if you have a sequence of functions which get close together point-wise, well then the areas would get close together too. But this is not so. For example, this sequence of functions converges everywhere point-wise to the zero function. But does the sequence converge in L1 to the zero function? Well, the modulus of Fn minus the zero function is just Fn. So the integral is the integral of Fn, which is 1 over n times n squared, which equals n. And this certainly does not tend to zero as n tends to infinity. So this sequence does not converge in L1 to the zero function, but does converge pointwise to the zero function. So pointwise convergence doesn't imply convergence in L1, or what we call strong convergence. And the other way around doesn't work either. Strong convergence doesn't imply pointwise convergence. You'll see examples in the correspondence text. Anyway, there are just different sorts of convergence. Now, I said it's this sort of convergence, using the geometrical idea of a distance, which lends itself to these very interesting applications. And I said that there are other geometrical ideas that we want to generalize. The idea of size and angle. Well, let's think, why should we be interested in generalizing size and angle? Well, think back. In an ordinary vector space, if we have vectors of unit length, so we need length, and orthogonal, then we can form a basis. And the value of a basis is we can express any vector in the vector space as a linear combination of the basis elements. Now, think how nice it would be if we could express every function in a vector space of functions as a linear combination of basis functions. That would be lovely. So what we have to do then is to generalize the idea of size and angle. And let me start off by generalizing the idea of size. In a general context, we call the size of a vector its norm. And we extract its essential properties and use them as axioms. And a vector space which has a norm defined on it, which obeys these four axioms, is called a norm space, which is, explains that part of, in our title of our course, norm spaces. Let me quickly go through the four properties. This norm, this real number, has to be positive. It's only 0 for the 0 vector. If we multiply a vector by a scalar, that's a real number, it comes out, multiplied by the modulus of the real number, and it obeys this triangle inequality. That simply tells me that the sum of two sides of a triangle is greater than the third side. It's a generalization of this nice geometrical idea. Well, our problem is to define a norm for functions. Now, how we do that? Well, let's go back to the more familiar context of ordinary space, R3, and see what the relationship is between the size of a vector, the norm of a vector, and the distance, or the metric, in R3. When we consider R3 as a vector space, we represent a point G in R3 by its position vector. And we take the norm of the vector to be its length. So given two points in R3, the distance between them can be obtained by constructing the vector g minus h, the opposite side of the parallelogram, and taking the length of this. In fact, whenever we have a norm space, we can always define a metric on it like this. That is, given any norm space, then if we define the distance between g and h to be the norm of g minus h, this definition of distance satisfies the four rules for a metric. Now, in L1, our metric is defined like this. So we can work backwards to ask whether we can define a norm which satisfies this equation. Well, there's an obvious candidate, the integral of the modulus. The question is, does this satisfy the four rules for a norm? Well, we've got to verify that these four axioms are satisfied by this expression. Well, the first one is easy enough. 
Certainly this number is always positive, the integral of a positive function, so that's okay. What about the second axiom? If f is the zero function, its integral is zero. But there's a little bit of a problem here. It should be zero only if f is the zero function. And we already know that the integral of a function which is zero almost everywhere is zero. So this doesn't work. We really ought to say if the function is zero almost everywhere. Well, actually, there's a gentleman's agreement about this that we'll identify functions which differ only on a set of measures zero. And so I can whip off this almost everywhere and we return to this axiom in its pure form. And the third axiom is clearly true. If I multiply by a real number, it comes out as its modulus. And the triangle inequality also holds because, well, it holds for the images, which are real numbers. So that's fair enough. Uh, I've managed to define a norm for my space of functions L1. Well, I'm very happy about that. But remember, I said I'd like to define the other geometrical idea, angle. Well, how am I going to define angle? Well. Remember, in the case of R3, the idea of angle is related to the idea of inner product or scalar product in R3. The inner product of G and H is the product of their norms times the cosine of the angle between them. So the angle is determined by the norms of G and H together with their inner product. Well, before I abstract these ideas that an inner product has to satisfy, let me remind myself why I'm interested in defining an inner product. In fact, I'm particularly interested in the idea of orthogonality. That is, when two vectors are orthogonal, when that angle theta is 90 degrees. And in that case, the inner product is zero. That's what I mean by orthogonal vectors. Why is that interesting? Well, if I have an orthogonal system, like I've drawn here, then I can express any vector in my space as a linear combination of this orthogonal system. And the coefficients are got very simply in terms of the inner product. So that's why I'm interested in defining orthogonality, an inner product. So let's see what the essential properties of an inner product must be. Well, if I have a vector space on which an inner product is defined, then it's got to obey four properties. Well, very similar, very reminiscent to the four properties obeyed by a norm. GH has got to equal HG, fair enough. Uh, the inner product of a vector with itself is positive. Again, we have to have this zero only for the zero vector. But the very interesting fourth property is the one that tells us that it must be linear in each element of the inner product. That's very important. Well, now I know what the properties of an inner product have to be, let's see how I can define an inner product for functions in L1. Well, the way to do this is again go back to our old friend R3, and by analogy, see what is the relation between norm and inner product in R3. If we take h to be equal to g, then theta will be equal to 0. So cos theta will be 1. So the norm of g squared is the inner product of g with itself. Well, we know what the norm is in L1. It's just the integral of modulus of g. And so the norm squared is just given by this expression squared. Well, that enables me to make a good guess at the inner product. If I try this expression, then that's a good guess. Why? Because if I put h equal to g in this expression, then I get g dot g, which should be the norm squared, remember, is the integral of the square root of modulus g squared, which is just the integral of modulus g squared, which is precisely what the norm squared is in L1. So that's a good guess. It maintains that relation. But is it an inner product? Well, I have to test the four axioms for an inner product. And I'll go straight to the one that doesn't work, the last one, the linearity. This axiom does not hold for that guess. Why? Because a complicated expression like this with square roots and squares and all sorts of things 
hasn't got a hope of being linear in G. Too complicated. In fact, if you think about it, the only possible expression of this sort, which could be linear in G, is some simple expression like that. That's linear in G and H, and in fact, you could verify the other four axioms for an inner product as well. Well, let's see what this does to our relation here between norm and inner product. Well, if I put G equal to H here, I get the integral of G squared for the norm squared. But that's not the same as the integral of modulus of G squared. So this does not give me the square of the norm in L1. Well, that's very embarrassing. What I've got here is something which is a good candidate, in fact, the only candidate for an inner product, and it doesn't maintain my relation between norm and inner product. Well, what will I do? Well, I really need an inner product. As I explained, it's a very lovely thing to have. So the only thing to do is to abandon the old definition of norm in L1 and redefine the norm using this relation. In other words, I'll define the norm squared as being given by g dot g. Now, with that definition, I get this new definition for the norm. It's the square root of the integral of g squared. Because it's a new norm, I put a subscript 2 on it, but it is a norm. It's different from the old one, but that doesn't matter. I've still got a norm. So what I've managed to do by this trick is get a space with an inner product and a norm defined on it. Well, there's just one problem. Is this integral always defined for the product of two integrable functions? Well, we know that L1 is not closed under multiplication. In fact, even for an integrable g, it's not always the case that the integral of g squared exists. And in that case, even the norm of g wouldn't exist. This is the counterexample we used in the last program. The function g is integrable, but the function g squared equals h is not. Well, we get round this problem as follows. We define a new space L2 as being the set of all measurable functions whose square is integrable. And that's what the 1 meant that we've been using up to now for L1. So L2 consists of functions which are square integrable, and that immediately gives us the fact that the norm of these functions is defined. Well, is the inner product defined? For two functions, g and h, each of whose squares is integrable, can we say that the product is integrable? Well, this is the case. First, we note that because g plus h squared is positive, we can expand it and rearrange the terms to get this result. Then the same reasoning with g minus h all squared gives this result. And putting both of these together, we get this. But a half g plus h squared is integrable because g squared and h squared separately are integrable. So the function gh is dominated by an integrable function, and gh is measurable because g and h are measurable. And these two conditions, we know, imply that gh is integrable. So this inner product is always defined in L2. By the way, saying that I have an inner product, I've assumed that L2 is a vector space. But is L2 closed under linear combinations of its elements? Well, the fact that it's closed under multiplication enables me to prove that it's closed under linear combinations also. We have to show that any linear combination of G and H is an L2. That is, we have to show that the square is an L1. Well. The square is a linear combination of g squared, h squared, and gh, all three of which are in L1, so the whole expression is in L1.
So, by definition, AG plus BH is an L2. So we have this really beautiful space L2. It's, it's got everything. It's got an inner product. It's got a norm. It's got a distance. In fact, it's got generalizations of all the geometric ideas that we were looking at. But we only got it at the expense of discarding our old friend L1. Well, was it worth it? Well, the answer is yes, it was worth it, because now we can have an orthogonal basis. Remember, the advantage in having an orthogonal basis is that, just as in the case of R3, we can express every vector as a linear combination of basis vectors. In the case of our function space L2, that means we can express every function as an infinite linear combination of basis functions. If we choose the trigonometric functions, this is called the Fourier series. Because I've got an infinite series, then this equality is in the sense of convergence, and the convergence is in the sense of the norm of L2, strong convergence. Well, does every Fourier series converge to its original function? The fact that it does depends on a property that we saw at the beginning of the program. And the property is metric completeness. Just as L1 is metric complete, so too is L2 metric complete. And the fact that L2 is metric complete is just the fact we need to guarantee the convergence of the Fourier series in L2. Now, the ability to define Fourier series in L2 is what makes it such an exciting space to work in, and far more exciting than our old space, L1.